So the first thing I want to talk about today, uh, homework two is post. I posted it Friday shortly after lecture. I meant to announce it last Friday, but, um, you know, I forgot. In the, the storm of everything that was going wrong on Friday that I was dealing with uh, and trying to still push that lecture through, which I think worked out fine, uh, despite how much frustration it was on my end. Um, I forgot. So I did post it Friday, but let's talk about it and formally introduce it today. You can click on this. It'll pull up the homework doc. And let's talk about what we're doing for the next two weeks. We're going to learn how to um, how to uh, build a static site. So we have our TCP socket server, which is just serving effectively hello world and a few different status codes. We messed around with uh, writing HTML, uh, HTTP responses, especially today. I'm going to get those two mixed up a lot because we're talking about HTML. Uh, but when we're you're serving your HTTP responses, you're forming the headers, you're setting the content length, we're doing some good stuff there, but we're only sending plain text. So for this homework, what we want to do is expand that and start serving an actual website. I have a sample site here for you to download. It's a zip file, download it, extract it, and get the files that are in there. I have, it's a very basic site. It doesn't really do anything. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, so don't get your hopes up that you're going to see some cool site. It's something I whipped together in like five to 10 minutes or so. Uh, so there's a sample site. There's also an images directory here with a, a lot of, uh, low res images, low res. So they're small file sizes. So it's gonna, uh, not going to bottleneck our testing, uh, too much or submission to Autolab. So that our goal is to host that site plus a few other features. The first objective is just to host the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, this we're going to talk about on Friday, these MIME types. The important thing here is to get the MIME type correct. So instead of sending text slash plain like we had before, it's going to be text slash HTML, text slash uh, style, I believe is the uh, the MIME type for CSS, text slash uh, or scripts. I shouldn't have tried to do this because I don't know them off the top of my head. Um, script slash JavaScript, maybe. I don't remember. Uh, but getting the MIME type correct. And then telling the browser that, hey, we're sure we have the MIME type correct. Don't bother messing with that. All stuff we'll talk about when we talk about encodings on Friday. Uh, then host, hosting UTF-8. So uh, finding the content length of a UTF-8 string. There's a little more to it than getting the length of the string. We have to make sure we're measuring the bytes of the string is the big, uh, uh, big point that we're making here. We have to measure the bytes of the string. And, uh, and set that as the content length. Because UTF-8 characters, the non-ASCII UTF-8 characters, are stored in more than one byte. They have multiple byte representations. we got to make sure we send the content length this number of bytes because that's what it represents. Yeah, Each byte is one character for ASCII strings. And ASCII is a subset of UTF-8. UTF-8 is a superset of ASCII, rather. Uh, both are true, but... Um, so those non-ASCII UTF-8 characters are more than one byte. So we got to be careful of that. Hosting images. I have that image, image directory. For this, we actually have a few things that we're doing. We're hosting the images and hosting content type image uh, JPG. But we're also hosting multiple images on our site with pathing. So this is our first, uh, first real introduction. Uh, maybe that's not the right way to word it. But our first introduction to pathing with wildcards. So if we have a request for anything at slash image at this path, then slash an image name, whatever this image name, that's the image that you should serve at that path. So uh, so we have uh, a handful of images in that images directory, and you have to host all of them at their respective path using a wildcard or at least preferably wildcard. I'm sure some of you will cheese this and hard code it for all the images in that directory. That's gonna catch up to you on later homeworks though. Uh, just, uh, just a heads up. Uh, so host those images. And finally, objective four, which is a pretty good step up in difficulty from the first three, is serving a path with a query string and serving that path with an HTML template. So now when somebody makes a request for the path images, a little different than uh, image name does not include the extension. Or sorry, image name does include the extension. 
in objective four, it does not include the extension. And that, that's uh, stated in the, the instructions here, if you forget. Uh, images, different from image in objective three. When somebody makes a request for images, they're going to also have a query string. And you can assume that they you only get valid requests for this, or you can uh, let your 404 take care of the invalid uh, invalid ones. I'm not going to do, we're not going to do the error checking for invalid inputs for this one. But there will be a query string with a name and images with multiple images separated by a plus. So for example, images, a query string, image, images, cat, kitten, dog, and name Mitch. You need to serve a page with a welcoming message for Mitch, like, hey, Mitch, here's the pictures that you, you requested or whatever you want to say to Mitch uh, or the, the requester here. And also include the images that were requested, all of the images, which will match image names in the images directory that you did for, uh, for objective three. So you need to serve dynamic HTML. So you, you can't possibly, I mean, you could technically, but you can't hard code every possible image a uh, combination of images, because you have two to the number of images. I think I have like seven or eight. So like two to the eight uh, different paths that can be requested. You're not going to do that. And then also any name, any string for a name that, that's uh, uh, valid, uh, valid in a query string. You're not going to hard code that. So what we want to do is build an HTML template, which is a partial HTML document, a partial HTML page, where you're going to read that and then replace certain variables with the parameters that you want. So for example, you'll mark in your HTML, some mark of your choosing, you could choose how you want to do your templates, but some way to mark, this is where the name goes. And then load up your HTML file. And the easiest way is to do a find and replace, find where you have your mark for, this is where the name goes and replace that with whatever the value is in this query string. So we're starting to see, this is still a static site, but we're starting to see where we can get a little bit of a dynamic here where we can serve different content depending on what the user specifically requested, depending on user uh, user provided data. Uh, but we are still making strictly get requests here. Uh, users are just getting content from us. They're never sending us information. That's gonna be for homework three, where we build a dynamic site. Uh, and there is a bonus objective here. The bonus objective is worth 10%. So you can get a max of 110% on this assignment. And uh, the bonus objective is to take my crappy front end that I provide as a sample site, throw it away, and build your own. Build something that, that looks nice. You know, it, it can't be as low effort as, uh, as the one I provided. Uh, you're not going to get the full 10% for that, but build something that looks pretty nice. You can be creative. You can build the site, however you, whatever you want the site to be. And since I'm sure I'll get this question, I'll answer it now. If you have already built a site like this for another class, I will allow you to use that one. So if you took 199, for example, and you want to host that site, as long as it meets all the criteria here, I'm going to allow that mostly just because I don't know how to police that. Like, I, I don't know how to say, oh, this looks like the site that you use, you know, uh, for something else. Uh, but it does have to be your code. So, for example, if you did this for another class and you just downloaded a template and just use that, use somebody else's code, that's not okay. And it's usually really easy to spot a template. Uh, I, I could spot a template from a mile away. It, it just, if it looks too good, generally, um, generally, I know you just use the template. Uh, so it does have to be your code. To, which is part of the AI policy. You know, it has to be your work. Uh, but if you did work for another class, I will allow that, which is against the university policy. But you know what? I'm going to allow it just because it's not fair to the students who are going to do that anyway. And then I can't catch them, really. I'm going to uh, enforce AI where I can and allow it where I can't, uh, generally. And then submit. Grading is the same as before, except the, uh, the bonus. If you get a one on the bonus, I'm not giving you any points for that. Uh, just attempting the bonus doesn't give you any bonus credit. But if you get a 2 or a 3 on the bonus, I'll give you the 8 or 10%. However, we are allowed to use your code from the server. Yeah. So you can use my sample site. So I give you this so you can do the assignment proper. So you're not required to write any HTML, CSS, or JavaScript for the assignment. I give you the site so you can get through the assignment and still get your points and complete the assignment uh, using that sample site. 
if you want the bonus 10%, you have to write your own stuff. So using mine doesn't give you the bonus 10% for the bonus objective. To complete the bonus objective, you have to write your own stuff. Uh, so if you want to get that 10%, you have to write your own code. It, using my code doesn't give you the extra 10%. I don't know if that's distracting. Let me know if uh, if you can hear anything that's going on around me. But there's a, a little bit of activity around me. The, my daughters are off for the week. So they're up here, which means the dog is definitely up here because he wants to protect all of us. Uh, so just let me know if anything's being distracting, and I'll kick them all out. Right, girls? I'm going to kick you out if you're too noisy. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I am. Yeah. All right, so let's get into some slides. And my, you probably heard me mention this briefly, but my shoulder's been really hurting. I have no idea why. But uh, uh, I, I'm using my mouse left-handed now because my right shoulder is, is just... Uh, really been hurting since the beginning of the semester. I think it's the way I lean on it when I'm using my mouse. Um, so I've been trying to rest that shoulder. Um, yeah, a little heart loss. Yeah, they 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 don't have any schoolwork to do today. So they're like, Dad, can we just watch you work? I'm like, I, I mean, I guess. It's weird having a live audience, but I'm used to having just computer audiences. Maybe I should make them go downstairs and watch on Twitch. I am getting old. That's, <laughs> it's part of, that's, uh, part of what my wife said. You're just getting old. You're going to get start getting more sore in places. Okay, left-handed mouse. I did practice once upon a time. I was practicing left-handed, so I'm not terrible at it. Uh, so luckily, it's it's not too bad right now. Do some stretches. I've, I've been stretching it. I've been trying to exercise it. It's, it's slowly getting better now that I'm not using my mouse on this desk with it. But. Or just use Vim. Ethan said soreness starts at 24. My soreness didn't start quite that early. Well, maybe. Uh, yeah. You know what? Let's get on with lecture, though. I did have, uh, at a pretty young age, I had shin splints. So, And uh, I guess at 24, my knees were hurting. So you know what? I guess. Uh, but I can blame both of those on stupid things I did, just abusing my legs. Uh, I was running track, and I, I beat them up. Um, all right. So today, we're going to talk about HTML and CSS. Uh, this is, I, I don't think there's, you know what, there is, there are some places where I do ask you to use this in the course still, even though I'm giving you the front end now, even for objective three that we just went through, you will have to write some HTML. Uh, I don't know. I don't think there's a place where I force you to use CSS, but it's recommended for your project. If you want your project to look nice, which I hope you'll, you'll want to take pride in your project. Oh, by the way, yeah, that's another announcement. I forgot the, uh, that's worth, uh, worth mentioning is uh meeting start this week so make sure you're getting with your team scheduling your meeting uh and filling out the team meeting form let's hope i'm logged in yeah i'm logged in fill out this form describe which tasks you accomplished since the previous meeting this is the first meeting so just leave this blank unless you have actually completed something and the tasks that you're you'll accomplish before the next meeting so during your meeting at a absolute bare minimum you should decide what each person is going to do for their task before the next meeting and then show up to the next meeting with that task complete. Uh, I'm going to leave the logistics up to you. It's not going to be for those of you who took 442. It's not going to be like that where you have a project manager. I'm not going to have a TA watching over you. I'm going to leave this really open ended uh, and and I'm just going to hope, which will be true for some teams and false for others. I'm just going to hope you're going to be mature enough to be able to manage the project by yourselves. Um, so uh, the tasks that you'll accomplish before the next meeting and then accomplish those before you get back for the first meeting your tasks you know they don't have to be programming tasks it's perfectly fine if it's your tasks are uh look into how django works and go through the django tutorial things like that uh, they don't have to be programming tasks this early in the semester um but your team should agree your entire team should agree on what people are doing and then rate yourself and your other teammates on these criteria when we get to the end of the semester and for each checkpoint, I'll give some feedback. But at the end of the semester, I'm going to look through all of your meeting reports from all of your teammates and everything. I'm going to look at all this data, and that's when I'm going to decide the individual grade adjustments if needed. So if there's somebody who's clearly slacking, um, especially if there's somebody who hasn't even filled out the meeting report forms and their teammates gave them low ratings, like, it, you know, you can tell what my decisions are going to be like that. So if you're a slacker, 
these meeting report forms is what's uh, what's going to identify you. Uh, then I'm going to look in at the repo, look at your actual contributions, and if they match what your teammates have been saying, don't expect to get a good score on the project. Uh, that only happens once. You only get one project grade at the end of the semester. At the checkpoints, if somebody is slacking, I'll reach out to that person and be like, yo, if if you keep doing this throughout the semester, you will be getting an individual grade adjustment. You'll be getting a terrible grade. So just uh, um, be aware of that. And those of you who are doing what you're supposed to be doing, uh, give details on these meeting reports, especially if somebody is slacking. Let me know in these comments. In 442 last semester, I had a lot of groups with slackers. And uh, team their team members would fill out really terrible evaluations for them on a regular basis and then leave the comment section blank. Well, that doesn't really tell me why you gave them such low ratings. Tell me why. Tell me exactly what. Because I'm not just going to take your word for it. I want to look in the repo and verify that they have been slacking. So if you're like, man, they, they just didn't do any code, or uh, which if they didn't do any code, I can see that. But if they broke code and it's completely broken, tell me which commits. Tell me, you know, give me some details. Tell me where to look. So I can look at the code they contributed, go, wow, that code really is terrible. I can, uh, if need be, if I really need to investigate, I can clone that commit. I can run it. And if it, say, doesn't compile, you know, there are things I can do with that. Uh, but if you don't give me much evidence, I'm not going to spend too much time looking around myself. I'm just going to look overall, do they have commits? And if they have a decent, you know, even a low number of commits, I'm not going to make any changes. Uh, but if you give me some comments, that always helps. So make sure you're filling out this form. Everybody should fill out this form by the end of the this week to say what you've done in that meeting. You should do it right after the meeting. But when I check this form on Saturday, I should have a submission from every student in the class. All right, but meetings start this week. Uh, required meetings anyway. You're, of course, rec you know, advised you should have more meetings than just one a week. But uh, especially when you're building up to a checkpoint, you want to submit a checkpoint. But, uh, but I don't want to spend too much time. I already spent too much time talking about that. Meetings start this week. I could have just left it at that. <clears throat> All right, so today we want to talk about HTML and CSS, uh, two of the, the three like basic foundational technologies for building a website. HTML, the structure of any web page, and then CSS, adding style to that page. These are the two topics we'll talk about today. And this lecture will go pretty quick because, honestly, there's not much technical stuff to talk about today. And I, I try to have these two boil down to just the technical topics, and even then... I don't know. In my opinion, at least, HTML and CSS are pretty easy to learn. Uh, difficult to master, it's one of those things, but to just learn the very basics that we'll need for this course, uh, not not much to talk about it. Uh, what about PHP? It, that's not like one of the fundamental three. I, you can build websites without PHP. I haven't built a website with PHP in a long, long time. Uh, but building a, a website without one of these three... I mean, it can be done, but you know, it, you're going to be pretty limited in what you can do. <laughs> if, yeah, exactly. If HTML is confusing to you at this point in your career, uh, you're uh, taking a 300-level CSE course. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you either. That's a, that's a good way of putting it. Uh, I mean, we teach this stuff in, in 199, and those students do fine. Um, so I want to focus on... Um, Actually, I would, I'd go, that that sounded bad. I'd go pretty much much further in, i talk about things that we don't talk about in 199. Let's just talk about it and you'll see. <laughs> All right, so here's our first HTML page. Just a very, very simple, basic page. Uh, and I want to talk about what's going on here. Uh, you, you didn't learn? I thought we taught HTML in every 199. If you took CC199, what is a P tag? Thanks, Danaski. Uh, so here's our very first web page. And let's just go through this uh, line by line. Or not line by line, but kind of overall. So this is the HTML. The HTML is going to determine what content goes on the page. And this HTML here is going to render as this web page. So this is what it's going to look like uh, without this border. Just first web page in big letters and then my content in small letters. Uh, that that's what will display if this is the entire website. This is what will display in your browser. This is what your browser sees 
and your browser renders this for you as this page. Uh, so let's talk about what's going on in here. So HTML, the, the core of HTML, what HTML revolves around are elements. So we have HTML elements, which are defined by open and closing tags. With these angle brackets, if we have these angle brackets around some string, that's going to specify an open tag. So this is the start of an HTML element. And then the closing tag is the identical syntax, except with a slash, a leading slash right after the open, um, right after the open angle bracket. So this is a closing tag that signifies the end of an HTML element. So for example, title, the title element begins here and ends here. And then everything in between the open and closing tag is the content for that HTML element. We can nest these, which is one of the big powerful things with HTML. So for example, the body element contains three other elements, h1, a, a p, and a div. And we can nest these even further. We can have more elements inside of other elements. We can just have elements all the way down. We have an HTML element as the top level element which contains the head and body. Head contains this meta tag and the title. Body contains h1, p, and div. Uh, so we have elements inside of elements. And that's the, the core structure of an HTML document. So let's go through a couple of these. And I won't belabor you with, you know, this is a list, this is a table, this is... But I do want to highlight just a couple, just to show that you can have different tags, uh, different element types that render differently in the browser. So first head, every HTML document, technically not every, but you know, for, for intents and purposes, mostly, you can leave off the head, but uh, but most HTML documents and every one that you'll see has an HTML element containing a head and a body. The head is all, is all content that does not display on the, uh, on the browser. This is meta information about the uh, about the page itself. Uh, here I have the character set saying this is a UTF-8 encoded page, which I believe is implied if you leave this off. And the title, this is what displays in the tab. So when you have that tab open in the browser or a window with no tabs, just this page, this is what displays in that, uh, in that tab, uh, which technically isn't part of the page itself. It's a meta information. It's a way the browser can organize the pages that you have open. Next, the body. This is all the content that will display on the page. This is what displays in the browser window that the user is seeing. And we have a few different tags here. Uh, a header one. Headers can be one through six, one being the largest, six being the smallest. And that's going to make this larger. That's why first web page showed up so big on that first slide that we saw with this. Then a paragraph. P for paragraph is going to give us some text information. And it'll add new lines and format this like a paragraph. So if we have multiple paragraphs in a, uh, right next to each other, HTML is going to, or your browser interpreting the HTML, is going to separate those by new lines and separate them into paragraphs the way we'd expect. And then div, probably the most useful HTML element and the least, um, and the one that has the least features, I would say. Uh, it's a featureless container that we just use to put things in. So we, we want content on our page. We don't want it formatted like a paragraph. We don't want to change the size of it. We don't want to have it linked to another page. We don't want to, we don't want it to have any features. We just want to say, there's some content here, divide it by, uh, you know, divided, divide this from the rest of the content. So we have a division and then we typically use CSS and JavaScript to spice up our divisions. Our divs are just gonna mark things in HTML and then be used later to actually make them do things. Uh, so divs are very useful. If we don't want the built-in HTML features, if we don't wanna use any built-in HTML elements and properties or anything or styling, like H1 is, uh, you know, it's styling done by HTML, but our styling should really go into the style sheet. So we like to use divs these days and then let CSS handle our styling, JavaScript handle our features. So divs, very useful. Uh, and also span is a, 
is nice as well. Span is like div, but div will add a new line at the end of uh, of the div. Span is all inline. So both of those are pretty useful. Uh, so I said elements have an open and closing tag, but some elements, their open and closing tags are the same tag. So we call these self-closing tags or self-closing elements. And the syntax for this is having a slash right before the end of the open tag. So we have here an image, the URL for the image. This is a relative URL because I don't have a full URL. I don't have the, um, I don't have the uh, protocol, the host, and the uh, the port, optional port. Uh, so this is going to be treated as a relative path. So I'm going to say get slides.png from the same protocol and host and port that this HTML document was requested from. So if I'm going to cc312.com and that HTML includes a, an image with a source slides.png, it's going to say make another request cc 312.com slash slides.png. That request is going to be made to the server. Uh, new line characters and horizontal rules. Again, self-closing tags. We don't need an open and closed tag for a new line. So we just say line break slash self-close the tag. And, uh, and we're good with that. Uh, I want to mention this at some point, but I'll mention it right now. HTML, or rather browsers, are very forgiving with HTML errors. You should do your best to, to have good, validated HTML. There are HTML validators out there you can run your site against, and it'll check to make sure all your HTML is, is valid. Uh, but browsers are very forgiving with this. For example, if you leave off this slash, are your browser still going to render that as a new line as a, a line break. Uh, it, it's not going to be too strict with you on that. Uh, and with a lot of things, if you miss some closing tags, if your tags don't line up, you can have some pretty crappy HTML. You know, the browser's going to work with you, work as hard as it can to try to render the page anyway. So this isn't like a, a compiled language, like a Java, C++, uh, a Scala. It's not like that where if you have one error, nothing even runs at all. With HTML, the browser's going to do its best to try to render that. So if you have mistakes and it still renders, it doesn't mean you're right. It just means the browser said, hey, you're wrong, but I'm going to render this anyway because I think I know what you meant. Uh, so just a, a heads up on that, that you can have pretty broken HTML that still renders. It doesn't mean you're right. Uh, oh, I didn't. I, I went through these slides. It's like the one change I made was moving that up. I guess I forgot to upload them. You know what? I didn't push. That was my problem. Uh, I never pushed them. So uh, HTML elements can also have attributes, which are key value pairs that go in the open tag of an element. So we have an element here, and we can see a few of these, the char set UTF-8, language English. Uh, well, this is a, a special tab saying this is HTML. Uh, in this one, I'll highlight ID equals my div. So we have name equals value or key equals value. These go in the open tag, not the closed tag, not inside the content. And this specifies a property of this div tag. So this div tag has a property named ID with the value my div. And that's, oh yeah, comments. Uh, HTML does not support line comments, only block comments. And the syntax is this. I don't have much else to say about that. That that's the syntax for it. Kind of a pain actually, since you can't uh, since just to add a comment, it's what's four seven characters that you got to type. It's kind of a pain. If you find your keyboard shortcuts and your IDE of choice, it's a lot easier. Uh, but kind of a pain, in my opinion. And uh, you can add any UTF eight characters in your HTML by using its Unicode value. So here I'm saying ampersand that's saying I'm giving you a Unicode value. Give it the Unicode value followed by a semicolon and then this is going to render on the HTML page as its Unicode character. So here I have this rook. I want to put a rook character in my code in my HTML. 
I can escape it like this. So that's the um, the Unicode way to add any Unicode character into your HTML document. Uh, some characters have special names. Oops. Some characters have special names. The common ones that we use, you might have in 115, possibly again in 116. Do I mention that? Uh, 199, I believe we mention it. Uh, where you have to escape your HTML for security purposes, which we'll talk about when we start taking in ingesting user uh, provided information. But we need to escape our greater than signs, our less than signs, our ampersands, so nobody can write HTML. If you take away their less than and greater than signs and their ampersands, there's not much that a user can do to inject HTML into your site. Um, which again, we'll talk about that for in uh, later in the, the course uh, in more detail. But if you replace the less than sign with ampersand LT semicolon, LT is the shorthand for the UTF-8 character less than. So if you replace your less thans with ampersand LT semicolon, that's going to officially escape that and then not have it rendered as uh, as HTML because you'll have the escaped character in your HTML. It's just going to render as plain text. Is this one of the it's kind of it, it's more of a foreshadow of one of the big security warnings, uh, but I will give the I will do that more justice. I don't even have a slide on that in this slide deck, but I will do that more justice when it becomes much more important, because right now it's not important when you're just building static sites. But once you're taking user supplied information and displaying that on your page, then it becomes uh, in displaying it to other users. Then it becomes a much more uh, much more of a problem, which will which will come up in homework three. You're gonna take uh, take user images and captions, and then display those images and captions to all users. So if that caption contains HTML uh, HTML, then you know you're screwed. You have a big security risk. Uh, when you're just hosting your own HTML, or uh, or in the case of homework two, you're taking a query string and displaying that query string to the user who requested that. Uh, the user can only attack themselves with that, which you know, that's not not that big of a deal. Uh, we're never storing that and displaying it to other users, so it's not critical yet for where we are in the course. But this is a big foreshadow to um, to what that is. We're gonna use the UTF-8 encoded or U Unicode values, we're going to escape those characters and they're not treated as HTML anymore. Uh, another useful one, non-breaking space. Uh, HTML, or rather your browser, is going to ignore any extra white space in HTML. So if I put three spaces here, or two spaces here, I guess, or three, this should render as three, uh, three spaces here, it's going to be treated as a single space. So if I want more spaces, one way to do that is to do non-breaking space is an escaped character, and this will add additional spaces. If you want a lot of space, there are other ways to do that. We can have uh, use CSS to add big blocks of white space. Um, but if you just want a little bit of extra space, non-breaking space, the UTF encoded space character. And that's HTML. That's all I'm gonna talk about HTML. Uh, I, I wanted to focus on the concepts of HTML, the concept of an element, the concept of an attribute, uh, the concept of tags, and uh, and leave it at that. If you want to learn more things, you want to look up links, and this is another slide that I updated that, I, that I'll have to push. Um, this was uh, the homework one from last year. But links, lists, tables, uh, forms we actually will talk about when we get to the homework three content. But links, lists, tables, things like that, uh, just head over to W3Schools. Uh, spend a few hours there. You'll learn all kinds of cool stuff about HTML, uh, how to build a lot more, you know, a lot more elements. And it'll build upon the foundation that we saw today. It's going to be elements and attributes. Those are the two big things you're working with with HTML. And the elements can be nested. Those are, the, the I'd say, the three big concepts to understand with HTML. And then you can easily pick up a lot of, HTML elements that do different things that you want them to do. All right, so let's go to CSS. I gotta do a time check. What do we, 11, 10, 20, so 11, 10, 15 minutes of CSS. 
So with CSS, we're adding style to our HTML pages. You, we can, it is possible, I won't even show it though, um, to add style in our HTML directly using the style attribute. Uh, it does the same thing that we do with CSS, but it's good practice to separate the style from the structure of our web pages. So HTML is just the structure and the content, any, uh, any content that we want displayed on the page. And then we use CSS to actually style it and make it pretty. HTML doesn't care about making it pretty. It just says, here's the raw content. CSS doesn't care about the content. just says, here's how to make it pretty. Keep those two things separate. And it's easier to maintain your code. It's easier to maintain, uh, I guess not co technically code at this point, but it's easy to, you're, to maintain your page when you have these things separated. If you have the style mixed in with the structure, it's just a lot harder to to manage things and, and to, um, to organize things, to modify things, to add, to add on, or to change things. If you, uh, if you have the style tags all over your HTML and you want to change the color of every paragraph, background of every paragraph to from green to blue, you know, that can be a big pain. If you have it in CSS, it's really easy to, to make that change. Uh, this is still true. You'll never be graded on the quality of your, uh, how, how much your website looks. You notice for the project even, I don't have any criteria on there that says your site has to look good. Uh, ideally, you'll take pride in your project. I hope you will and want to make it look good. And you are allowed to use HTML templates for your project as opposed to the bonus uh, homework two bonus question. You are allowed to use them in your project, but they do require a, uh, a report if you use a template. Uh, usually those templates come with some, uh, with some conditions. Usually you have to leave a reference, uh, a link to their site at the bottom of your site, uh, things like that, those would have to go in your report, but you, they are allowed. Um, but you're never graded on how well your site looks in this course. We're focused on the back end and the features, the project grading criteria, it's all about the features. It's not about how, how well it looks, how well your site is organized from the user perspective. That's all about, um, that's all Alan's class. Take Alan's um, uh, HCI, human computer interaction you'll get all of that stuff. Uh, I want this course to, to just be focused on what we focus on uh, without getting too much, uh, too many things. Uh, it's easy to have a course with too many things that we're covering and then nothing gets covered well. Uh, and you don't have time to really think about anything. Every homework is just coming to flying. So we're, we're, uh, we're not gonna grade you on that. Focus on the back end in this class. So here's our first sample of CSS. And I'm just gonna dive into some of the syntax with that. The CSS, we're going to specify an element name, an element type, rather, and then start adding properties to it. So here, I wanna say the body of this page, set the background to aqua. Aqua is a named character in CSS. CSS has some pre-built named, uh, named characters, named colors in it. Aqua is one of those named colors, so we can set the background to aqua using its name. Uh, I'm also going to say every paragraph, the text should be red. And here, uh, red is a named color in CSS, but just for the sake of example, I'm using its RGB values. So we use this format, a hashtag, and then two characters for red, two characters for green, and two characters for B as hex values. So here I have 255 red, zero green, and zero blue. So this is going to be just strictly red. So it's going to be a red color. If I had 00FF00, that's going to be green. And if I had some mix, say I had like 999999, that's going to be some sh some shade of gray. So we can mix our RGBs and uh, and say how much red, how much blue, and how much green to be able to make mix uh, a lot of different colors. And then I'm changing the font size as well to 50 pixels. So instead of using H1 through H6, a better way to do that is to use CSS and then specify the size of your uh, of your font um, instead of using the, the H1s through H6. You can still use them. I still use them on occasion uh, just because they're simple, it's easy. Um, but we have more flexibility if you use CSS to add that styling. 
they're those RGB values are from one to two fifty five. So yeah, th so these are multiplied. So this is the these are the least significant four least significant bits, and these are the four most significant bits, and then they're concatenated together to form one, uh, one uh, byte of information. Uh, and there's tons of properties. I just gave a few. For example, just to so show the syntax is how you can add multiple properties, end the line with a semicolon, and then just add more key value pairs for your properties. And the braces, the what you want to modify, and then the braces containing all of the properties that you want to change. This is the syntax for a CSS file. And then we link. Oh, yeah, and I, I moved this over. That's another change I made. I, I saw all these. I just didn't push. Um, so here's our page again, but we're going to add this CSS to the page and we're going to render it at like this. So our paragraph text is going to be large and red and the background is going to be aqua. So to do this, to link our HTML and our CSS, this will be saved in a separate file named style.css in this case. And we're going to link those with a link, a self-closing link tag in the head of our HTML. So we're going to link. We're going to say, hey, browser, this is a style sheet that we're linking. The MIME type is text slash CSS. Uh, that's uh, how you should treat this with this type, which is going to match the HTML, uh, the HTTP. I knew I was going to mess that up. I was, I was so happy I didn't mess that up recently. The HTTP header of content type is going to be text CSS. That's going to be the type of this content. So this type is going to match that type from that request. And then the href, where can this file be downloaded that you're linking? So we're going to name that style.css, host it on our server. And now the browser, when it gets this HTML, is going to make a second HTTP request for style.css from the same server that it got the HTML from. Color can be, yeah, color can be regular text too. Yep. Uh, just like this could be um, could be the RGB values. I just want to show that you can either use the name text or the RGB values wherever a color is expected. So yes, you can use a, a named, we could do just red right here. Would be the same effect instead of hashtag FF0000. Uh, but a lot of times, at least for, for my cases, the, the named colors... There's just not enough to choose from to get all the colors that I want. And I, I'm always messing with the RGB values and handpicking uh, specialized colors. Uh, so we saw that we can change the style of an element type. But what if we want two different... So in this example, what if we want two different paragraphs that have different style applied to them? We can't do that the way the way I've showed you so far. We can only change the style for every paragraph or every div uh, in our page, which usually isn't what we want. Uh, if we were doing that, we probably wouldn't. We we're not really leveraging the power of CSS. We could add that style right in our HTML and you know just be done with it. To really leverage the power of CSS, we're gonna add classes to our HTML elements. So we're going to, yeah, our, our, our RGB is 0 to 255. Yeah, um, yeah, I did answer that. I, I didn't specify the 0. I, I saw the 1 to 255, but I, I, I didn't correct that to 0. 0 to 255. Um, so we're going to add classes to our elements using a property. So the class property class is going to equal red or green which these classes are whatever you want to name uh name them no that's fine Nancy. that's good information you expanded a, a little on what i said too um so the the class attribute is going to be whatever you want to name your classes and then in your css you can specify every paragraph and then use this dot notation every paragraph that has the class red make it red, make the text red. Every paragraph with the class green, make that text green. So this is a way that we can get more fine tune in what we want. 
Then we can have multiple paragraphs with the class green, multiple par paragraphs with the class red, and uh, and have more flexibility. I, I just said that, didn't I? Have more flexibility in what we can do uh, where we apply our styling. There are also cases where we want the same class name used across elements of different types. We can do that too, just by leaving off the element type. We can say dot green, meaning anything with the class green, make the color green. So if we have a paragraph that wants to be green, it doesn't matter that it was a paragraph or what it was, everything with the class green is going to be colored green. It's going to have green text. And maybe we want different behaviors in our red paragraphs and our red divs. We want to reuse the same class name. Then we would say p.red. So any paragraph that's red, apply this. And then this div is not going to be red because I specified exactly the type of element and the class together. So this is red as an and. If it's a an element of type p and has a class of type red, then color it red. This, we have class red, but it's not a paragraph. So we're not going to color this one red. That's, this styling will not apply here. Uh, and every paragraph, this applies to every paragraph. So both of these paragraphs will have large font. But even if we had, if this was a div of class green, then this will be green because this applies to every element with class green. So again, more flexibility. And one last piece of flexibility, we can also use IDs. So earlier we, we had a div where we gave it an ID of my div. IDs, is, uh, that's an HTML thing. IDs have to be unique. You cannot have two elements on the same page with the same ID. These are identifying unique HTML elements on your page. So I'm gonna give this ID my div so I can, outside of this HTML in my CSS and in my JavaScript, I can specify that particular element and make modifications to it and do whatever I need to do with that, um, with that div. This is especially useful in uh, when we get to JavaScript on Wednesday, where we can have our JavaScript grab a specific div uh, or a specific element, read its value if it's a user input or output to it, and we can know exactly it's going to this ID, this element, because it's, there's only one. These IDs have to be unique, so I know exactly which element I'm working with. In our CSS, which we're talking about now, we use the hashtag or the pound symbol if you're old like me. We use the this symbol and then the ID name, and we can apply styling to that specific element. This is only going to be applied to the single element with the ID of my div. So this element here is going to get this double border style. We're just going to have a border that's two, uh, that's two lines, like two borders. Yeah, you can have the same ID on two different pages. Yeah, because when you're on when you're on a page, the way the internet works, when you're on one page or another page, those two pages have nothing to do with each other at all. Even if they're hosted by the same server, they're they have absolutely nothing in common. Nothing is shared uh, until we start talking about like cookies and stuff. There can be some some uh, illusion of sharing there, but they're both rendered as completely different pages. When you click on a link and your browser reloads that link, that browser is treating that as a completely brand new thing with no memory of the previous uh, previous page you visited. Uh, everything beyond that is an illusion that's built by us, which you'll learn all about in this class. We're gonna we're gonna be building all kinds of illusions. What happens if you put color in P? Uh, weird things, weird things happen. Uh, so, so I'll, uh, CSS, at least for me, it's really finicky and for a lot of devs out there, it's really tough to get CSS to do exactly what you want. There is some override order, but I don't remember off the top of my head what the override order is. So if we put a color in P, I don't remember if it goes like in order of the file. I think it goes by specificity. So like P dot red is going to override just P. Uh, I believe, but I think the order also matters. 
which really makes CSS pretty finicky at times, trying to get everything exactly right, especially when you're importing a library. Like I like to use bootstraps on my pages. So I'll import bootstrap CSS and then also add my own CSS to it. And the library and my CSS are often fighting against each other. Uh, it, it can be a pain to get CSS to do exactly what you want to. Uh, and you can have multiple classes separated them by a space. So this div has the class green and the class wide. So we can apply two different stylings to it. Which is the last thing I want to talk about. CSS and, uh, and HTML. So again... Just like HTML, CSS, head over to W3Schools if you want to know more, if you want to know all about the different properties you can add, all kinds of different things you can do. Check out W3Schools. I always recommend that reference. It's nice, easy to digest, easy to go through, and teaches you a lot of things. That's how I first learned web development. Uh, I just went through W3Schools and started clicking around till, uh, till I knew front-end stuff, which now they have, actually, when I first used it, it was only front-end. They actually have a lot more now. Uh, there's a lot of tutorials on W3Schools now. A lot of good information.